dirt. So greetings everyone. My name is Samsara Morgan. I'm the founder and executive director of the Open Data Book Foundation. Welcome to our International Midwives Day celebration. Yay. <laughs> um, it's a particular passion of me to celebrate this holiday. I think that uh, midwives are amazing. And I've been a doula forever, and I'm in the process of becoming a midwife, and I can't mm -hmm. wait to fully be a midwife. Um, these hardworking, mostly women, are you know too busy delivering babies and doing good works to celebrate themselves. So I always want to make sure that they get lifted up and know that we see what they do, and we really appreciate actual midwifery being practiced in the world, and know that that, that good care saves lives for all babies especially African-American babies who sadly are lost more often in this country. So we are going to uh, celebrate midwives, lift them up. We have our beautiful uh, Maria Milton here to speak to us. Maria is a treasure in our community. Her mama was a treasure. May she be pleased with us as she looks, at, looks down mm -hmm. at, from heaven at us mm -hmm. um, as we hold her up with adoration, admiration. Um, we're so happy to have Maria here, who is a practicing midwife. I'll have her introduce herself in a bit um, and to talk about her mother's uh, journey and practice and her own journey and practice, because we all want to know how you do it, how you did it and how you're doing it and how it's going. Mm -hmm. So let us start with uh, just a moment of prayer, just a moment of connecting with our ancestors in whatever way that we do that, whatever way that feels comfortable to us. Uh, let us hold in love and light the memories of all our grand midwives. Uh, may they rejoice in heaven that we remember and, and, and hold them sacred, hold the work they did, the ones who never got a book written about them, the ones who never, no, no one even knew their names, but they still serve so beautifully the families in their community. We wanna lift them up, lift up all of our present day midwives, be they certified professional midwives, lay midwives or nurse midwives. May their hands heal and may their hearts be committed to uh, physiological birth. And um, I think that's what I wanna say about that. Mm. Um, so I'm going to uh, invite um, our wonderful birth worker and music maker, Betsy Rose, to uh, give us a song. Mm. 
Great. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, hi, everybody. It's so good to be with you. And um, I want to sing a song that I wrote um, about 28, 29 years ago. And I want to just take a minute to tell you about it um, as a way of, of a little bit of telling you about me and, and why I'm here. I think a lot of you know each other and I don't know you. I only know Samsara. So I am not a midwife and I just became a doula two years ago at the age of 68. I was a performing musician all my adult life. But the story of this song actually begins when I was a young unwed mother when I was 18 in 1969 and gave birth to a little girl at a time when there was no support and the hospital was a cold and unfriendly place. And I had the kind of birth women were having in the 60s and before, medicated, uh, forceps, uh, paralyzed, uh, didn't know what was happening to me. It was, it was not a great birth. Uh, it was a beautiful baby. Um, this ba I lost this baby. She died of crib death since five weeks later. I'm um, sorry. Thank you, thank you. And I went on to, to recover as best I could and pick up my music and go forward, but it never left me, of course, it, it tears me up to this day. So 22 years later, I was blessed to, uh, to, have, to give birth again. I had a rainbow baby and um, I was all about midwifery. I was all about, um, you know, attachment parenting and natural birth. I just, I just was so ready and said, waited so long. So shortly after my son was born, and I did have a midwife in the hospital uh, at my birth, um, uh, the nurses at Alta Bates, I believe it was, I mean, sorry, the midwives at Alta Bates were under a serious threat. And I'm sorry, you may remember this better than I do, I'm, uh, but just under serious threat of losing their privileges there. There was a kind of a backlash after they'd had a chance to, to do births at the hospital. In, along with physicians in some way. And they had a rally and they invited me to sing. And I, cause I was a political activist folk singer. And so this is the song I wrote for that rally. And I've been singing it at midwifery conferences ever since. And it means a lot to me. And it means a lot to me to share it with you today. There's a little, um, I know, a little cut on my finger. Um, there's a little chorus at the end and I put it in the chat in case you want to sing along. And there's also a line I'll ask you to repeat with me. So it's called Call a Midwife. And I wrote it way before the television series. When I first found out that the baby was due, I called up a friend, I said, well, what do I do? She said, get a lot of sleep, eat what you can. The first thing I recommend is call a midwife. I'd love it if you'd sing that with me. Call a midwife. So I called the number and my call went through. It was a real life voice. Woman too. She said she could see me in a day or two. She said, congratulations, you called a midwife. You called a midwife, let's do it. You called a midwife. I had so many questions, I had so many fears about the changes in my body and the coming years. And she gave me time. She listened to my story. She gave me time to feel my trembling and my glory, cause it takes time. It's not a medical situation. It's a long and a deep gestation to grow a mother out of a woman, grow a baby out of her soul. When my time had came and I felt the rush, I felt the waves and the need to push, I was beyond my limit of what I could stand. I reached out and found the hand of my middle. Try 
to tell you you're not qualified if they ever try to draw the laws too tight. Me and my baby gonna fight for the midwives. Ooh. So reach out your hand if you need more strength. We'll all push together. We'll all go the length. Cause it's about the power of an old tradition About the power of a woman's wisdom It's about the future, about the soul About the sacred, about the soul And it's about the babies who are coming in About our world and the shape it's in It's about the body, it's about the birth It's about the woman who's given so much Betsy. Thank you so much everybody. Yes. Much much love to you. Thank you for all you do, all you are. It means so much to me. Thanks. Thank you. We're going to ask Aquila. Aquila, where are you? Aquila. The screen is dark. Here you are, babe. You're on. So Ms. Lula Cross is our beloved poetess, and she is so kind. She's running in between, uh, in between appointments in life, and she's going to give us a poem for our event. So introduce yourself. Lula. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much, Samsara, for um, the opportunity. My name is Aquila Lewis Ross. And I am just gonna ask for you guys forgiveness right now, cause I'm not really in a good space, um, going through a whole lot. And I've made a decision today to actually get a therapist because I'm not able to make it <laughs> right now. <laughs> There's a lot of, a lot going on in my life. Um, I'm from the Bay Area. My family was pushed out to uh, Las Vegas, Nevada um, during the pandemic. And we made a decision to kind of come here for one, because there was nowhere else to go. And for two, we wanted to um, kind of rebuild our lives and start over. Um, and it's been a struggle. It's definitely a struggle when you're trying to, when you know you, you, ha you, you can see your future and you can see that there's something that you're supposed to have, um, which is beautiful and good and peaceful. Um, and you don't really, and for me, I really didn't have any um, mentors or role models. I can't really, tr I can't really rely on my, my mom or any other family member. So I'm kind of by myself and I, I'm feeling it now that I have a, a daughter. She's three now. Um, my birth experience was pretty challenging because I'm a survivor of uh, a lot of, a lot of things. <laughs> and, um, and so I went into my my labor and the birthing in fear. Um, and I didn't really feel comfortable until, um, I guess it was the fifth day of labor. <laughs> and, um, and they brought in, sorry, I live in a, a complex where there's people who are really loud. And then my daughter's loud too. So I don't really have any quiet place. So I apologize. Um, so the, the birthing, um, the one time that I really felt kind of somewhat comfortable with that labor experience was um, 
through a, a they brought in a Reiki specialist into the hospital facility. Um, yeah. So I, what I, my, my journey and my story is kind of long. So if I could send the information to some star, if people are really interested in, to learn more, but I'm a poet, I'm a spoken word artist and, um, the arts has been kind of like my healing mechanism as I go through the labor of life. <laughs> Seriously, my hair is, is gray because of my labor of life and probably because it's also genetic, but the labor of life has really got me. <laughs> um, I'm laughing, but yeah. Um, so my poem, a poet and poetry has kind of helped me kind of stay sane a little bit through my journey. Um, and uh, April, for those who know about um, poetry and poets and um, April is National Poetry Month. And what poets do, they write a poem a day for 30 days. And I'm going to share, um, I, have to, I have to go to my Google Drive. I'm going to share some qu a quick poem that, is, that I wrote for that. Hold on one second. Um, the name of the poem is Toddler, Toddler Cuddles. She's stepping into her own now. Surprise! People warn me about growth spurts, the energy and patience that it takes to parent. Mothering sure keeps me on my toes. But I kind of dig how she pushes the envelope, like mo most great people do. All hail to warrior princesses with fists in the air who, who write most things that ain't fair. Practice makes perfect. I used to yearn for perfection. A dream deferred, but one, two, three, four. Slowly counting this quick step of her life. Regret has no place here. Just love and lots of cuddles. I wipe away tears, dreading when she doesn't need me to wipe hers anymore. Aw, that's so sweet. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I'm not sure if I, I'm not sure if I really believe that right now because today her little um, toddler self <laughs> is really pushing the envelope. <laughs> it's like the tide so it goes in and out, you know. It's like the tide. <laughs> <laughs> the tides of the wave. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you. I think that's that's all I can really manage to get out right now. <laughs> God bless y'all. <laughs> That is fine. Thank you so much for being here. And my love and prayers go with you. Let me know if I can help you in any way, sweetie. Ms. Milton, how are you today? I am so good. Thank you for having me and thank you all for joining. Thank you for gracing us with your presence. And so I just, I want to make this as easy for you as possible. Um, and we're all, you know, I, I very much want to know uh, about, let's start with your mama and as much as you know, like how she became a midwife, how she was called to the service and what her practice was like and how her practice ended if and when it did end. Well, actually, my mother was recruited to become a midwife by the Walton County, Florida health department mm -hmm. uh, during that time things were segregated and um, the doctors in the area who were practicing were only two but it really started out with the, the doctors coming forth because the midwives in the area at that time uh, were either no longer practicing or they had gotten too old or they just basically died out altogether. Mm -hmm. I was born in 1957. And so it was during that time, days of segregation and all. And so uh, uh, women of color basically had no rights to go to the hospital. And in fact, for a long time, there was not a hospital. And so because of uh, the midwives not practicing and not being available, 
uh, the doctors in the area were having to do it. And so whenever the doctor came to our house to deliver me, that was when he contacted the Walden County Florida Health Department and was telling them, listen, I, you, I've been hearing that you needed a midwife and somebody that you can train. And I think I just met this person. Her name is Gladys Milton. And we're so busy uh, really delivering babies that we don't have time to take care of the sick people. And that was attitude about uh, birth at that time. And that's what it still should be. Birth is not an illness, it's not a disease. Uh, people are not sick whenever they're pregnant or getting ready to give birth. And so that started the, the health department to contact my mother who uh, initially said no. She said it was almost like going into the kerosene business when you know, we had electricity during that time. So she was saying, no, she was a little hesitant to do it at first, but she did go on and eventually be trained as a midwife. She did home births for the first 17 years of her practice. And then in 1976, she opened up the birthing center that I now still operate. But at that time, I wasn't even thinking about becoming a, a, a midwife at all. Uh, whenever I did go to college, I did so with the intentions of becoming a medical doctor. But I still didn't like the direction that medical was headed uh, during my last senior year. So I had the opportunity to enroll in midwifery school. And I thought that that would be a good way to use the skills that I had learned and be able to help, actually really help. Uh, because in medicine, the first thing is to do no harm. And I realized that birth was becoming much more medical and that it would be a way to to help women and, and, and really do well for myself too, because one of the things about being a good midwife or even a bad midwife at that point, you are playing a, a crucial role in women's lives. Uh, birth is a big event for them and they will remember it forever. And like my mother used to say, since they are going to remember it, it might as well be good memories. But it also needs to be good memories, too, because women are so vulnerable whenever they are giving birth. And I found out how scared women are. And a lot of that is just because they're not as informed as what they should be. And that's what midwives do. And I thank God for all the midwives who have come before us and the midwives who have given us the shoulders to stand on now. Uh, they really showed us traditional midwifery, which is what it should be. Uh, birth should not be medical. It has become more medicalized. And you have, uh, and I'm not down on them, but nurse midwives who have uh, kind of, you know, gotten to the point where they think that they are better than the more traditional midwives. But I do want to make it very clear, and especially somebody who was born during the days of segregation and who experienced segregation, uh, these midwives were quite skilled. They were quite confident. Some of them didn't have formal training, but a lot of them did. But sometimes these nurse midwives have a tendency to think, well, you know, they weren't as trained and they weren't as competent as we are. Well, if you are a nurse midwife, I'm not down to you and thank God for you, but you are a midwife first. And that's what needs to be taken in consideration. You're not a nurse first, you are a midwife first. And thank God that you do have your little nursing skills that can come in, but so do other midwives. And most midwives can only take care of those women who are low risk. And both birth is that. Uh, the body is designed to do it. And I, I know, and especially now that I am a midwife, a lot of these problems are being caused from the way that, that birth is handled. Women need to be talked to. They need to be given the information that they need to keep themselves low risk. But a lot of it is just basically taking care of yourself and doing what you need to do uh, to, to give birth. And one of the things is, as best to say, call a midwife, call the midwife. But midwives had a different attitude during that time. They were making sure that these women were being given the, the actual care that they need because birth is more than just a physical being, it's a psychological being. Some of these women uh, just need to feel less scared, but you have to take in consideration too that, that life is a journey. And, and, and since you go through life and since you have so many things that can't be predicted, you certainly wanna start out 
uh, life as best as possible. And that is by having the most peaceful birth as possible. And the only way to do that is to try to have a midwife who can take care of you. My mother, again, Gladys Milton, was one of those midwives who did that. All of the midwives who practiced during that time, they made sure that they not only did the services as birth, but whatever else other services that these women need too. These women were members of the community. They were healers. They were uh, grandmothers. They don't. They just took care of the whole gamut of it. And so, uh, I am thankful to have been the daughter of a midwife. And I'm thankful for segregation too, because it gave me the opportunity to see birth done outside of a hospital setting and to know that birth is not dangerous and that what makes birth dangerous is the way that it is. So uh, when I did have the opportunity to become a midwife, uh, that was what I did. And uh, for the first like uh, 15 years of my practice, my mother and, and I were, I was fortunate, let me say, I was fortunate enough to work with my mother, but she and I worked together for those 15 years. And then as it happened now, uh, we had a baby on Monday she had a heart attack and died that Thursday. So, you know, and at that time too, that was in 1999, uh, she died in June, but her midwifery license didn't expire to December. So I always say, you know, I've never known a time that she wasn't a midwife, I didn't. She started delivering when I was two years old and did those home births for the first 17 years and went into homes not having all of these problems and really opening up the birthing center, still not having problems. I still don't have problems. Problem. Because one of the things that she told me, which is the best advice that I could have been given, and advice that I try to pass on, not only to women, but to midwives in particular, in the absence of problem, that means the baby's heart rate is good, that means, you know, the woman's blood pressure is good, that means, you know, everything's going okay, wait, hurry up and wait. Because a lot of this failure to progress is just failure to be patient, to wait, or oh, women are scared. And sometimes women have had uh, uh, issues in their lives where they've been abused, they've been uh, like neglected, or uh, uh, just don't have the emotional support that they need. And so once they're given that, then they have the tools that they need to at least get started in life. And I, I just always have been thankful for all of these midwives and for what they've done to try to promote natural birth. And especially uh, being that, you know, most women have kind of, especially with the younger women, uh, the older women kind of know birth because they at least had midwives and that kind of stuff, or they had the, the hospital birth, knowing that, okay, this is not the way to give birth. And some of the nurse midwives actually arose from that. You had these nurses who were working in the hospitals with the doctors, knowing that birth could be better than that, that it should be better than that. So they may have more or less started uh, delivering babies and kind of developed the uh, nurse midwives profession and, you know, kind of took it from there. But the whole point is that a midwife is a midwife is a midwife. Uh, they should still take care of low risk women. They should be able to know what constitutes a low risk woman. And of course, if problems do come up, there's no doubt that a midwife would need to know how to handle those problems. But the whole point is, if a midwife is just a midwife, meaning with women, as midwives are supposed to do, not a lot happens. And if women take care of themselves, the problems come in when women are induced, when they're given pain medication, when they're not allowed to eat during labor or walk around, or just I would say the birth environment is not a good environment to be in. That's something that all midwives try to create, and especially the more traditional midwives, because we understand that it's a life-changing event and that women just need to know how to give birth on their own because they're the ones who are actually giving birth. I mean, we, we talk about how we just live women give birth on their own. And I have a lot of women who, you know, kind of like pat me on the shoulder and sing my praises. Oh, Maria, you're so good. And I'm so thankful for your skills and for what you do. But I told them all I do is to help you. And really it's you all who make me look good. And I mean, I, I, I'll just 
like it, you know, it, it makes me feel good when you say that. I say, but well, the truth of the matter, you are the one who actually does the work. You are the one who takes care of yourself. You come in here. I don't give pain medications. I don't, I, I practice strictly after childbirth because that is the best way to do it. But what I was telling them, when you take care of yourself and listen to the advice that I give you, and then I give them freedom to, to choose. You can't demand what each each birth is different, each woman is different, each situation is different, and I allow them those individualities. And I also allow women the opportunities to ask questions to uh, get clarification for things that they need clarification on. And so when I do that, then I tell them they come in and forego the pain medication and do all of that. That is what makes me look good, but I'm not gonna take the credit for it. I always have to give them credit for actually making me look good as a midwife and allowing me to do what I, I do as a midwife. I really love that. I love how you, you know, you don't take the mom's power away. You you place it back where it belongs, which is, you know, that, that mom pushed that baby out and, you were honored to be there. But the power is with the mothers. Let's let's always understand that. I think if we can get that in our heads as midwives, the power is the mother. They are the ones. And our job, like I say, as midwives, that's what it says, with women, not ahead of them, dragging them forward, not behind them, pushing them forward. Individual attention to each individual woman. Each birth is different. And even a woman who has given birth two or three times will tell you, She's given birth two or three different ways. And that's what it comes into. The main thing though is uh, a lot of providers want to try to dictate to women what to do and how to do it. And sometimes they think they know what's best. Maternal instinct is so great, you know, and sometimes even with our training, you know, it's the, the, the book will say, okay, it needs to be this way. And if it's not that way, you need to look for problems. Well, I have seen it where everything's so smooth and calm, but it's almost like the quiet before the storm, mm -hmm. because sometimes with the woman's instinct, she will be able to say something just doesn't feel right or I, I don't know. I always pay attention to maternal instinct, but because birth is normal and natural and I treat it that way, I don't have a whole lot of problems. I don't make a lot of transfers. I've never, knock on wood, I've never lost a baby. I've never lost a mom, none of that. But it is because of the way that I practice and because I do know how to spot complications, but more importantly, prevent complications. When women eat right and take care of themselves, you don't have all these complications if you're not inducing them, if you're not breaking their waters, if you're not uh, speeding them up, if you're feeding them, if you're just saying it's okay to be afraid. Because a lot of times too now when I find out that birth is, is really as much psychological as it is physical, because I've seen it so many times where women physically are okay and there's no reason. But then I ended up going to a conference. In fact, at the World Trade Center in that. New York. At the World Trade Centers in New York, mm -hmm. there was a conference that went on there and a woman was talking about how sexual abuse can sometimes hold women up. And that's when I realized, hey, you know, in those situations where I've seen where everything's smooth, there's no reason for this woman to not be able to just go ahead and have this baby. Mm -hmm. uh, at that conference and during that session, uh, this woman was talking about how when women have been molested, when they've been sexually abused, sometimes when they've had abortions and have not forgiven themselves or, or have still un, unresolved issues about that with themselves or they don't feel worthy sometimes, how that can hold up a baby. And that's what I've learned. You have to address all those issues. Now, sometimes, especially with sexual abuse, they won't tell you that. And sometimes they never will, but sometimes you can just kind of pick it up in the way that they do. So don't don't try to ask sometimes if they're not willing to say don't ask. But if you put yourself there as a midwife, as their friend and let them know that they can trust your skills and your abilities, then they will relax and open up and do what they need to do. But the main thing is, uh, as long as they hurt and forego the pain medication and eat then they do fine. We don't have all of these problems. And so that's why I always want to make sure that women do have uh, midwives as an option for birth. And, and I, I tell women a lot, 
they are the ones that have to speak up because as midwives, we do what we do to try to keep our practice alive. But we're up against a medical profession that's very strong. You got doctors who, especially in the South, have made a, a, a concerted effort to try to wipe out midwives and to cash down on their compensatory hour. And, and that has led into it. And then you have so many of the newer women who are going to the hospitals having unnatural birth that they associate the problems that they're having with the midwives. But I'm telling them the problem is you're having because of procedures. If you would not have those procedures, you would not have those problems. And I've seen that over and over and over again. That's why I give the advice to midwives, hurry up and wait. If there's no problem, hurry up and wait. If there's a problem, then transfer these women to the hospital. That's what the hospitals are for. And then we have to understand too, that OBGYNs don't deliver babies in other countries the way they do here. Only in the United States do you have OBGYNs who have basically taken over the midwifery profession because they're doctors, they're surgeons, they're for high risk people. And they really do need to be reserved for high risk, but because they're too much in the low risk arena, making it high risk by making it convenient. And a lot of midwives too these days, they're concerned about liability, they're concerned about making money. None of that should come into play with the uh, uh, decisions that are being made about these women. You need to always do what's best for the woman and for her baby. And if you're doing that and you're giving care from the heart, a lot of times you will not have these problems. But what's happening is that women are going to the hospitals using the OBGYNs, having all these shortcuts, having all this unnatural birth, and then associating the birth with the midwives and, and being told when midwives are not safe, they're causing a lot of problems. And so more and more women are going to the hospital so much now that you only have about 4% of women who are not going to the hospitals to have their babies. So the more they go to the hospital and feed into this myth that birth is dangerous, then that's, that's an uphill battle for midwives to try to undo. So all we can do is deliver babies the best way we can. I always limit the women who I take on. Uh, right now, I'm not in Florida, I'm in Houston, Texas, so that I can come to uh, my uh, nephew's uh, graduation from college. Uh -huh. I couldn't do that. If you know, I'm saying you have to take on as many women as you can give quality care. And you shouldn't take on more women than you can actually handle because birth is not nine to five, it is 24 seven. They don't take, uh, babies don't take holidays. They don't care about if it's two o'clock in the morning or two o'clock in the afternoon. They don't care if you're tired. They don't care if you don't want to be bothered. So what? It's time to be born. And so <laughs> what I'm saying, they do it that way. And so what, what women need to do, especially as midwives, don't, don't worry about delivering all of the babies. Just do a quality few. And then take time uh, where you're not delivering babies sometimes because you have to take time for yourself for one thing, you have to recover. You can't just be on, you can't run like a robot and run like a machine. It doesn't work like that. But you also have to take time to spend with your family, take time and spend in the community and stuff like that. You can't do that delivering babies all the time because one of the things about having a busy practice if you're not delivering, you're doing postpartum care, you're doing prenatal care, and you don't have the time to actually just relax. Because let's just say if I were not here, I, I'm caught up for a while. Let's just say I don't have anybody hot and heavy, as I call it, which means I can breathe. <sighs> <sighs> I can go and work in my yard and I have to worry about checking the phone every few minutes to try to make sure that nobody's getting up with me. Uh, my nephew was highly upset. I had told him I wasn't going to come because of the COVID guidelines and all. But but as it turns out, I didn't have anybody who was honestly holding me up where I couldn't leave Florida and come to Texas. Mm -hmm. So he, he said, please come. It, it means a lot. And this is my late sister's grandchild. And what he was saying, if you could be here and my other like sister is here as well he was saying that you all are the closest I can get to have my grandmother here since she can't be here well mm -hmm. things like that those are family moments family events that come up too and those are the things that make life special and you know I was I, I say all the time babies were being born before I got here and babies be born when I leave here so I'm not going to even try to do them all I'm just going to make sure that the ones I do 
a quality birth and that I do enough where I can spend time with my family and then spend time with me. I need to breathe and take care of myself sometimes too. So midwives need to keep that in mind uh, when you're practicing, first of all, but always make birth special for women. They're going to remember you however you go at it, and they're going to remember the birth however it goes at it. So just like anything else, people will always remember the way you made them feel. So, so, so true. Really appreciate your words, reminders of self-care, because it can be overwhelming, and there's so much need. Um, I'm speaking for myself as a doula, I mean, you know, there's so much need and um, the hospital is sadly a very treacherous environment. <clears throat> and so you can get very caught up <clears throat> in how much you're needed and not, not take care of yourself and not pace yourself um, and, and know that you only can do what you can do um, and not push yourself to do any more than that and let, and let what you can do be enough, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But now let me add this too, because it's just, you know, just something that I need to uh, say to just kind of prove a point that I made. Please. Uh, my mother uh, passed away in, in 1999, but now she also uh, was a nurse who worked at the hospital. She worked uh, in OB at the hospital. I always worked that three to 11 shift, three o'clock in the afternoon, 11 o'clock at night. And there were times when, you know, she was with women trying to explain to them what was going on and what to expect and all of that. I've had a lot of women even to yet say this, you know, about how, you know, she was just a good midwife and a good nurse for them. But oftentimes, you know, uh, she would check out at 11 o'clock. And if this was a woman who she had taken care of on her shift, and this lady might have been an hour or so away from delivery, she would just go check out and then go back and just stay with this woman up until she delivered. And then, so after my mother died, there was a woman who called and she said, I didn't know anybody in the family, but I knew Miss Milton. And I remembered how special she made my birth. She said, I was 18. I wasn't married. I was scared. And she said, she was my nurse that afternoon. And she, you know, came in and explained to me what was going on and what to expect. Uh, she held my hand. She kept me encouraged and all. And she said that at 11 o'clock, she went and clocked out. She said, you're going to deliver this baby in another hour or two. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to stay here with you and all. And she said, she did that. She just made me feel so special. And I said, well, I'm glad to hear you say that. I said, because a lot of women have said that same thing to us through the years. You know, she clocked out at 11 and, and all that kind of stuff like that. So, so I said, I'm glad that she was able to do that. She said, well, after I heard that I was telling her, you know, I'm her daughter. Okay. She said, well, after I heard that your mother had passed, and I told her I was a midwife too. And she said, well, I hope you kind of be the midwife that your mother was. She said, because mm -hmm. after your mother passed, I didn't know anybody in the family except your mother. But she said, but I had to call and just make sure that somebody knew this about me. She said, because I never, ever forgot and I never ever will and I say well I'm so thankful to hear that and I'm glad that she was a, a special part of your life and I say and by the way how old is your son she said oh he's 27 now duh you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so what I'm saying is that the experience that you have on women, the way that you touch their lives, that'll be for years and years to come afterwards. So make sure that it's a special event because it is. And, and my mom used to get excited every birth, every birth, every birth. And I do the same thing. Every birth is different because even I've, I've had women who I call repeat women. You've had a baby with me and you will honored me enough to come back and have a, another baby with me. But what I'm saying, each one is different. So I treat it as an individual birth, but I also try to make each birth special because each birth is indeed special. Most definitely. I'm just so enjoying everything that, you, that you're that you saying. It's just so the, the, the meat and the spirit of midwifery is everything that you're saying. Um, I and that needs to come back. We're losing that as midwives. Yes. And that's one of the reasons why 
uh, we're having a lot of problems. I started to say, I think we're having those problems because of that. No, I know we're having those problems because of that. I've been in this business for 37 years now, okay? And so I'm not, it's not my first rodeo around, but I've seen the changes in all of the years go from birth being more natural to birth being more medical, people being more afraid, but they're being more afraid because of the way birth is being handled. And so I know that if women would use more midwives, and let me say this too, because this is key. And I, I, I know a lot of midwives of color who get upset with me about saying this. Say it anyway. There's no doubt that systemic racism is a problem. There's no doubt about that. Like I say, I was born in segregation. I went to colored water fountains. I went Oh God, trust me, nobody wants to go to a colored toilet. I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy, okay? But even during segregation, and I want to say, mention even during the days of slavery, black women were not dying the way we are now. Black babies were not having problems the way we are now. And that was because of midwives. Now, systemic racism plays a point. I mean, there's no doubt about that. But what I'm saying, when has racism been more systemic than it was in slavery and during the days of segregation? It doesn't matter. And then from what I've seen too, from being in a rural area and being in an area where midwives even delivered for white women, they didn't matter about the color. You know what I'm saying? Women are women, birth is birth. Uh, and the only difference that's coming up now is the way that women are being treated, but they're being treated differently because they're not being treated by midwives. Right. And then let me say this too, again, not down in the nurse midwives. Uh, so at one point, you know, you had the licensed midwife and the certified professional midwives who were calling the nurse midwives midwives because they were practicing in the same way as the doctors. Well, it doesn't matter who's doing the nonsense, it shouldn't be done during birth. And that's what I'm saying, we get away from the nonsense, get back to more natural birth, birth can be less problematic, it, it'll be cheaper. We spend millions and millions and millions of dollars on healthcare, and yet we have some of the worst outcomes in the world. In the world. And that's because we don't utilize midwives in the way that we should. We need to change that. We need to get birth back into the hands of the women, not midwives. We need to get birth back into the hands of the women because that is what true birth is. And we need to get as midwives back to being with women and Thank taking you. care of them in the way that they should be. And then we can reduce a lot of these problems and complications that we're seeing all the time. Oh my God, you have music to my ears. <laughs> music to my ears. Yeah. I want to open it up for a couple of questions. Does anybody have a, any questions for Ms. Milton? Can I just say thank you for speaking? I am about to go uh, and usher in a little person. And I just wanted to thank you. Um, I resonate with everything that you said because you spoke truth. And um, with you speaking and sharing this knowledge, that's how we're able to pass down this information and to train, you know, to hopefully feel your footsteps. Um, so just thank you. Well, and thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. And like my mother said, the best advice that I could give in the absence of problems now, hurry up and wait. <laughs> right. I'm going to go wait with mom. All right. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank Baby you. Blessings, Akila. Thank you. All right. Anyone else have something that they want to say, a question they want to ask? It's a wonderful opportunity to speak to this wonderful midwife. I have a question. Uh, thank you so much, Ms. Milton, for coming and sharing some story and um, hearing your words is so needed and refreshing right now because I think a lot of us have to hear stories that are not what you're describing. And it can be hard to, um, it can be hard to, to stay the path. So I appreciate you for, for giving me energy in your words. Um, also listening to you, it just struck me how your trust and your faith in birth is so strong. And I know that when practitioners approach a client with fear in their mind and in their heart, that that shapes outcomes and it shapes the way the care is given and it shapes the way the, body's, the body feels and the way the body responds. Um, and so I was wondering if you could share a little bit about how 
your faith and your belief, whether you frame that in spiritual terms or other terms, how that plays into your practice as a midwife? Well, I think a lot of it is the experience of having been born at home and knowing other people who are born and born at home. Uh, the experience of being born during the days of segregation and all. But I think a big, big part of it, and the reason I can get as bold as I am, I work for myself. I'm not worried about anybody firing me. My mother opened up this birth and center back in 76 when we didn't have a lot of the regulations that we have now that, that, that restrict us and stuff like that. And I realized it's different when, when midwives work in the hospital. You know, you have to do kind of like what the hospital says and what the doctors say. But that's why I say that's where the women come in. Women need to speak up. If women start speaking up for their rights, it gives the nurses who work in the hospital a better opportunity to work for them and in their favor. And if you notice, all the nurses in the hospital are not the same. Some of them encourage you. I mean, they'll wait till the doctor go out and say, you don't really have to do that if you don't want to. You know what I'm saying? And they, I mean, but sometimes they, they won't because the women will say, well, she said, I didn't, you know, she said, in fact, let me add this, let me add this. My mother worked for years as an OB nurse at the hospital. She worked for years. She got fired. And like my mother, uh, my father said, that was probably one of the best things that happened. And the reason I'm saying that is because my mother, like I say, she she would always stay there with these women. She would go clock out at 11 o'clock and go there. Okay, well, the doctor that afternoon uh, had some, it was early, I mean, he wanted to go home or he had something else that he wanted to do. And he demanded that my mother give this woman Pitocin. She said, I'm not doing it. These contractions are strong enough on their own. She's far enough on. Yeah, well, I got to go. And I, she said, you don't need to do that. So anyway, she kind of pulled her doctor back in the back room and said, you know, okay, hey, doc, you know, this is the way you need to do it. And he more or less said, oh, you think you're a little midwife and you just, you know, because you got that little old birth and son and da 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 who are you? And I'm an old BGYN. You know how they shoot the kids out and all that kind of foolishness and a trip on themselves and all that kind of stuff like that. But anyway, he demanded that she give this woman Pitocin. And she said, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. And he said, I said, give her Pitocin. And she said, I said, I'm not doing it. And if you want her to have Pitocin, you give it to her. Whoa, so he brave. He did. He did. Brave. And the woman's uterus ruptured. Wow. And they ended up in surgery and probably if they hadn't been at the hospital, they probably would have lost her and the baby. But she lost huge amounts of blood, massive hearing. They were able to save the baby, but they picked up a, uh, a uterus out in pieces, okay? <gasps> she goes back to work the next day and they're like, oh, Miss Milton, they said it was just one of those tragic things that happened, you know, just a complication of labor and delivery. And my mom say, complication of labor and delivery? What? No. I told him that Pitocin was what did that for you. I told him not to give you that Pitocin. I told him it was going to make your uterus rusted. She said, you did what? That's why I said oh, something. Oh, my God. Say, oh, well, I can't, you know. But anyway, she said, no, I told him that that she said Pitocin, first of all, increases the uh, contraction. You already have a strong contraction. I knew it was going to do it. But, oh, he ready to go and all this stuff that you don't. And, and, and let me point this out. This was during the, the days when nurses didn't, they give nurses a little leeway now where they can say a little something. But during that time, oh, all the information had to come from the doctor. You talk to the doctor and all. So, but anyway, so she was, she was breaking all kind of rules. But she said it really ticked her off that he had caused her those problems and then pass it off as just being, oh, just one of those things, you know, just a complication, it's just true. like they do now. A lot of mm -hmm. women cause them all kind of problems and lie to them and swear, oh, it's a good thing you were here and all that foolishness that women believe. So, but anyway, the woman, my mother straightened this woman out. And yeah, okay, all right. She goes back the next day and they told her, okay, you don't need to clock in. You need to go by the front office first. Well, why? I just need to go by the front office. She went by the front office and they told her that because of insubordination, that they were firing her. 
So she lost her job, and, and but but she already had the birthing center now. She was already coming home. I mean, she 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 stayed. Uh, I mean, she worked maybe about forty five minutes from where we live. So she was always coming home two, three, four o'clock in the morning. That was nothing new and different. And my father used to tell her, well, you know, you got the birthing center. Why don't you just give it up? And you're getting older too. You don't. And and the roads were a lot more dangerous. He said, you know, it used to be that a uh, woman be out on the road two o'clock in the morning. Somebody stop to help them now they might be stopping to hurt you yeah you get older you got the birth and center why don't you just stay home and just just do your birth and center you know draw your little social security whatever you're gonna do and then i think you know he said hey, we we're not rich by now we're not gonna be rich so don't worry about it you know what i mean just go on and let's just live our lives so but anyway she wasn't listening no oh, she you know wanted to go and be at the hospital and help the women there, which, oh, okay, well, then good. But anyway, like I say, the next day after she told this woman the truth, she got fired for telling the truth. That's why I say I can speak as both. I, I, I work for myself. My mom opened this birth center. I'm not going to get fired from, for telling you that you don't need something that you don't need yes, or telling you the truth about this or that and the other. But anyway, like I say, she got fired. And when she came home that afternoon, okay, uh, she, 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 she has just started at three o'clock. Okay. She got home probably about 4 30 that afternoon. And we could already tell, oh, okay, something is up because just the mere fact that she's back home. And so she came in and you could tell she had been crying and all upset mm -hmm. and everything like that. So my father asked, you know, well, well, what's going on? And she just started just crying. She just, just uncontrollably. She couldn't even, you know, speak. And so he said, well, okay. And that's what we were saying. Okay, just go ahead and get yourself together. And so she said, I got fired. You got fired? What? And then so she said, you know, kind of like the incident, she told the woman the truth. And my dad started saying, yes, yes, yes. Whoa, you got fired. You got... She said, what do you mean? He said, Gladys, that's the best thing that could ever happen to you. That's a blessing in the sky. You need to be here. You shouldn't be up there anyway. You can't tell these doctors nothing. You don't need to try to tell them nothing. You're a midwife. You know how to give birth. Birth here at the house, at uh, this birth and son. Forget them people. She said, he said, this is a blessing in the sky. And as it turned out to be, it was a blessing in disguise because like I'm saying, she didn't need to be on the road at her age. She was in her sixties and stuff during that time. She didn't need to be on the road like that. Mm -hmm. uh, she needed to do exactly what she was doing, birth in the way of these traditional midwives. And that's why I say as a black person, as a black person born in segregation, because I couldn't, uh, Gladys Milton was, you know, a, a lot of people uh, think about Gladys now. Oh, Gladys is one of the famous midwives, but Gladys was black. And Gladys, Gladys couldn't go to the hospital either, okay? Because of the okay. segregation. They ain't care nothing about her being whoever she later came to be. But like I say, I credit my birth for that because uh, after I was born and the doctor say, okay, y'all need to go train this woman to be a midwife. And, and that's what happened. And so I'm glad that uh, I, I've had experiences in the hospital, out in the hospital kind of birth, and I can make a true comparison. And even those women who have given birth in the hospital can tell you it's a deep difference when you got a, a midwife now who's doing much more natural birth. But the whole point is, it's the natural birth that decreases the likelihood of problems. And it's the, the interventions that are causing a lot of these problems that we're having. Yeah, that is so, so true. Anybody else want to say something? I'm just bowled away with joy. Because, you know, there's nothing for me to say because I'm just agreeing with everything. So y'all agree too. Say, say it out loud. <laughs> I just want to thank Maria for paving the way as a Black man, as a Black person. It's just important to see someone like me um, doing the amazing things you've done and really just creating um, a way for those who are coming up um, after you to just see, say, I can do that too now, you know, because of what you've done, I can say, I can do that too. And yeah, I just thank you for that. I thank you so much for your kind comments. Yeah, thank you. Anybody else? So since we're all just mystified with the joy of hearing everything that you have to say, 
I feel like I want to let you get on with your evening because you need to eat your dinner and it's very <laughs> late where you are, where you are. So I really deeply from the bottom of my heart want to thank you for giving us your time, uh, your treasure. Well, I thank you all for joining and I hope that I've said something that inspires you as a doula or as a midwife to try to uh, uh, encourage these women put the spirit back in the women, give them the, the, the knowledge that they can trust their bodies to do what their bodies are already designed to do. And they just need a little help and a little encouragement for it. But the most important thing is that it hurts to have a baby and there's no way to safely take away the pain. And that's another thing too, as I was coming up as a, a, a girl, uh, and my mother even going around to these different people's homes, there was a sisterhood, I'm going to call it there, because women would come to your house. If you had other children, there would be uh, women who would take care of your children. There would be women who would cook for you. Uh, they, and, but the more important thing when women were hurting, these women would say, oh, you are right. You can do it. Just breathe, just relax, or one less, one less, and then we're going to get our baby. Women need that kind of camaraderie these days. They don't have the support like that. And especially if they're in the hospital, first of all, they're consistently being ordered, uh, offered the epidurals. And then sometimes the mothers of these people saying, oh, why does she have to suffer? Can you give her something? She's suffering. So if we can change that idea that they're suffering, or that by the time you suffer, it'll be worth it to have a healthy baby that's not medicated, that doesn't need to be stimulated, doesn't need to go to ICQ. You can get up and walk around in two hours and all the stuff that you don't do when you're interfered with like that. So we need to encourage these women to be themselves and trust their body's ability to birth. And as midwives, stop interfering so much. Let these women exactly. you know, make you look good. Just make them make you look good. <laughs> well, one of the most profound things I think that I've heard you say was how, you know, we have to, to let women have their own power, let women be women, let women find that strength within themselves and to support that and encircle that and, and encourage that because it, it, um, it is very troubling the, the heavy, heavy medicalization of birth. It just seems to be getting worse every day. It is. I don't know it how is. things in, are in Florida, but the doctors here want to induce everybody at 39 weeks. And so, you know, the mamas have to push back on that. There's okay, and they end up going through this horrible experience, most likely ending in a C-section when they could have had this difficult experience that gives them so much. And it's like, to find the words to explain to someone who thinks it's crazy, like, why would I want to be uncomfortable? I can have this comfortable life. But in our comfort, that does not help us grow as well. I, it, they us started grow. telling these women at the hospital, why be a martyr? You don't have to be a martyr. Don't be a hero. But a lot of times, too, they, they want to give you the epidural so you won't be calling them. And you know, I'm just saying, especially at the hospital, if you got one nurse trying to take care of, you know, 10 people rather than 10 nurses trying to take care of the 10 women, you know, I mean, that's not how it works. So right. I mean, it's for their convenience and not for yours. And then they think about liability these days. They think about making money. Uh, epidurals cost. Uh, right. I mean, and now that when women have the epidurals and stuff, you know, they come and they put the little airbags, you know, and so it's just, it's, it's just a routine mess that's going on and like you said it's a domino effect too now once you start one thing then it goes to something else you end up with a c-section but the sad thing is that women don't know the question but more importantly they don't know that they have the right to say no and that they perhaps should say no. That's why I'm glad that doulas are coming back into play in the way that they are, because doulas are giving women the strength to, to kind of at least be more informed and, and perhaps say no. Yeah, and you know, if they don't kick us out of the hospital like they did during the beginning. Well, it, it, they won't kick you out if the women start speaking up, you know? That's and how we got in there years, in the first place. Years ago, they used to say, just say no to drugs. Say no to drugs and labor. Say no to drugs. Why, why would you say don't give a child drugs? 
I, I mean, would you give a two-year-old child drug? No. no. But yet you take a baby who has not even been born yet and drug them. All the drugs. So drunk that they got to go to ICU and sleep it off. That's crazy. And we do so much foolishness like that on a daily basis. It, just it, doesn't doesn't make, it defies common sense. It and it's not even good science. It's not right. even good medicine. <laughs> right. Jessalyn had her hand up. I just appreciate the way you described that so much. And I, I just did a very casual survey of some folks asking about um, elective induction. And I just wanted to share that there was a few medical examples, but at the end of the day, the reasons that people had inductions that, or wanted inductions that weren't medical was because it was the only way their husband was gonna get to be there because of parental leave and work leave, either from a nine to five job or the military. And I just wanted to add that other piece of um, family rights and parental leave and support for partners, because I think the other piece that's coming into that pressure to induce, then to get epidural, to use the Pitocin, I think a big piece of it, you know, is, is families really feel like this is the only way my partner is going to be with me. And so I just wanted to oh, add that, yeah. add that comment because I'm seeing more and more of that leading to that cascade of interventions that Ms. Milton just described. Absolutely. Thank you for saying that. Jesse, was your hand up? No, that was applause. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, and that just breaks my heart to think that a, that a person would have to endure induction. Like I've had babies and I've seen too many inductions and I'd rather have a baby tomorrow than to go through that laborious, painful torture. That is torture in my, in my opinion. Um, having a baby is joyful and crazy and God's all over it. And, it's very and then sometimes, you know, people aren't there. I mean, you know, we, we, we should not be trying to fit these babies within the time. Sometimes the midwife is not going to even arrive on time. You know what I'm saying? Uh, there's so that. My, my thing is those people who need to be there will be there. And only two people that need to be there is the woman and the baby. <laughs> the end of the day. And everything else. But I'm saying, I, I know how important it is for women to have the emotional support. So yeah, I can agree with that sometimes. But sometimes, you know, you just have to, if the baby is not ready to come and somebody does need to be deployed or somebody's leaving out of town, well, unfortunately, you're just going to have to spend time with the baby when you see the baby. You know what I'm saying? saying things shouldn't be rushed and shouldn't be put on a timeline or an order because that I've seen that too much create problems for these babies, you know, the inductions in particular. Because when babies are ready to come, they will come. And That's sometimes true. they'll come before you get there. The midwife is totally. a clear sign too that everything's going mm -hmm. just okay. Because to think about it, if things are not going okay, uh, of course, they don't use forceps and things anymore, but that's where the scalpers come in when the babies are not okay and you got to kind of go in and bring them out. But if they start coming so quickly that you don't even have time to get someplace, then that's a sure sign that everything is good. Okay. Mm -hmm. It yeah. may scare you to death, but nobody usually dies. <laughs> no, baby was just in a hurry to get here. Uh -huh. So one more comment, if there are any. Um. I would just thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Ms. Milton. It has really been an honor and a blessing and <laughs> and you and, and Samsara share a lot of the same faith and knowledge and and hearing hearing so many things that, that she said. Constantly um, agreeing on Facebook. <laughs> Maria and I always like she's always right. liking. I'm always liking right, her. Right, right, and, right. And your story, thank you so much for sharing. It really brings, you know, brings some grounding and some some faith back in it because it can just feel overwhelming and isolating being up in the hateful hospitals. Oh sure, oh sure, oh sure. <laughs> and and knowing that there are just babies being born that you're that you're there uh her you know hurrying up and waiting with <laughs> right i wrote right. that down I'm like, hurry up and wait yeah. that's 
a beautiful That's in the absence of problems now. If everything's yeah. going okay, yeah. then yeah, please wait. Please wait. And then let me say this again now. If if um things do seem to be going slow and physically everything's okay, know that emotionally that woman is not in the place where she needs to be. That's why early in care, you need to try to adjust those emotional needs that a woman may have. Exactly. And feel give her the openness to be able to communicate and stuff. Because sometimes they don't open up because they don't feel like they can. Exactly. And like in an OB's visit, the average OB's visit is what, eight minutes? Right. And a midwife's appointment's an and hour. And the average visit for a midwife is about an hour. Mm -hmm. Deep difference. Deep difference. You have time. But most, most, most OB's talk at you. They don't talk right. to you. And then they do a lot more. And that, that's just in the profession now. We do a lot more testing of people than we do talking to them. We need to talk more and test less. And tell women, it's really not necessary. We're just covering ourselves. <laughs> We're just making money. This tell is them the truth. truth. I mean, tell I the truth. We're going to do it. At least be upfront and honest about it. We're just making money. Mm -hmm. We ain't caring enough about you. We're going to do all these tests and not talk to women about nutrition. Then Thank you, them. which causes most of it, which causes most of it. You won't get anemic, toxemic, gestation, diabetic, none of that kind of stuff. All right. of it. All right. of it. Right. All and then, it. too, about, you know, because they are inducing women at 39 weeks. That's the biggest thing here, biggest trend over the last few years, because it's time. No, it's time when it's time. You allow these babies to come in, and if they're not having any problems, you don't need to be inducing women. You don't need to do anything. And even if the book says you need to be doing this or that and the other, if everything's fine, the baby position is good and baby's heart rate is good, you don't need to be doing anything except waiting. That's how I say it again. Hurry up and wait. Now, hurry up and wait. You know, and that hurry up and waiting is like singing with the mama, dancing with her, getting her Thank into you. a warm bath. Take a shower, letting her hug her, her mate or her mama or her aunt. Letting her set the pace is, is how it is for her. If she, if you do what makes her feel comfortable, then I, trust me, she will do a whole lot better. Even like I say, in those cases where a woman says has been sexually abused, has not said it, will not say it or whatever. If, she, if the environment is where she feels comfortable, she can still relax her mind enough to allow her body to do what her body is already designed to do. Yes, ma'am. So we're going to wish you a good evening. And okay, well, I thank evening. you all for joining. And happy, and happy International Day of the Midwife. Thank you. Wanna, thank you. And to people. all of you. Thank Blessings you. to you. Blessings to each of you. Thank you, Maria. Thank, thank you. you. We want to praise and give thanks to your mama for being the wonderful midwife that she was and for birthing you. Thank you. Thank you. And to all the traditional midwives, we owe a, a debt of gratitude to all of them. All Absolutely. Of them. They are mighty, mighty women, incredibly yeah. mighty people. Yeah. So um, I'm going to close our beautiful celebration and uh, thank all of you lovely folks for being here. Um, I want to... Before I close, I want to give credit to the song I played earlier, which is a beautiful song called She A Song by a young papa by the name of Justin Wilson. He's given us permission to use his beautiful song at our events, and I love uh, having it play as people are coming in and signing in and whatnot. So it's very nice to think that that song was written by an African-American daddy for his beautiful little brown baby girl. It makes me happy. So I'm going to thank him for his generosity in allowing us to use the song. I want to wish all of y'all a beautiful night. Peace and baby blessings to you all. And I will see you, most of you, next week, folks who are not visiting. Enjoy right. Florida when you go home. Take care. Take Bye -bye. care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night. Thank you so much. <laughs>
I probably have to get my nephew to close. <laughs> be fine. I will. Sh I will shut it down. I really love you, and I really thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank bye you. Bye, bye, dear. Me. All right. Bye. Bye. -bye.